Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. I'm so excited that you're joining us today to have Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. He's a Christian writer, a speaker, a scholar, done gazillions of debates, a professor, um, and has this website, talkaboutdoubts.com. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on, Zach. Great to be here. I'm doing well, thanks. Just started uh, the new term at the college where I teach. And uh, yeah, so, yep, we're ready to go. Yeah, that's super sick. And I'm excited for today. Uh, we're going to look at his debate with Alex O'Connor, which happened recently on like theism versus atheism. And we're going to kind of just like go through Alex's opening statement. And Jonathan's going to kind of share what he thinks, um, looking back at the debate and whatnot. So before we get started, Jonathan, do you want to talk anything about like who you are, what you do, um, and what got you in topics like this debate with Alex? So I'm an assistant professor of biology at a uh, Christian liberal arts college called Sattler College uh, based in Boston, Massachusetts. So I teach a number of courses. I teach uh, freshman biology, genetics and genomics, uh, microbiology, bioethics, anatomy and physiology. And uh, my PhD is in, in biology from the University of Newcastle. And uh, I run an organization, as you mentioned, called talkaboutdoubts.com, where we basically uh, mentor Christians who are struggling with doubts about their faith. Uh, we also talk to ex-Christians who want to explore whether there's a rational road back to faith. And basically, we have uh, a team of over 60 volunteers, uh, scholars in different subjects. We have New Testament scholars, Old Testament scholars, textual critics, philosophers, uh, scientists of various stripes, uh, uh, et cetera, psychologists, pastors, uh, or biblical archaeologists. And the idea is someone comes to our website who's struggling with doubts about faith and, and submits a contact form, which we then distribute to one of our scholars who then gets in contact with that individual to schedule a private Zoom call to talk about their doubts with them and confidence. So that's what I, that's um, one of my biggest passions is mentoring Christians with doubts. So if anyone uh, in the audience would like to uh, take advantage of that resource, then go over to talkaboutdoubts.com. Uh, as for how I got interested, as for how I, I got into doing debates, I've been doing debates a number of years with uh, people of different worldly perspectives, atheists, Muslims, uh, biblical Unitarians, uh, etc. And uh, I was involved with the debate society at Sattler College where I teach, and uh, they have organized couple of debates over the time that I've been at the college. The first one was with uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, who's a Muslim apologist. And the topic was Tawhid versus Trinity. Um, what is the true nature of God? And then the second time we did a debate with Alex O'Connor, who actually flew over to do it in person because he was also at that time uh, speaking at the Capture and Christianity conference in Texas. And so we stopped over in Boston and did a debate. And we also spent some time together uh, there. So yeah, I, I very much appreciate Alex's intellect and insight and uh, find him to be a very amicable guy and very, always enjoy engaging with him. So that's a little bit of background. Mm, yeah, that's super cool, Jonathan. Um, and I love how like your work is so like wide ranging. Like there's so many different things you've done um, with regards to like apologetics and like, all these like important <clears throat> topics. So I think that's super cool. So anything you want to say, Jonathan, with regards to like this debate and the context of like Alex's opening or anything like that before we like dive right into it? No, I, I think that uh, Alex and I came to the debate from quite different um, perspectives. Uh, I, I come at the topic as a scientist uh, with, a, with an interest in uh, data that confirms uh, the existence of God. I, I am a strong advocate of uh, intelligent design uh, and uh, offering arguments for design in nature, uh, particularly in my own field of expertise in the life sciences. Uh, I'm also very interested in historical apologetics, so arguments for the resurrection and things like that. So in my opening statement, I give a very condensed uh, form of the arguments from uh, from biology for design as well as from the resurrection of Jesus, uh, which also uh, bears positively on the the um, existence of God. And um, Alex O'Connor is more is more of a philosopher and uh, so he uh, approached the debate with the arguments primarily from hiddenness as well as uh, the problem of evil. So yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting um, 
uh, an interesting interaction, uh, though, as I said, we came at it from quite different uh, perspectives or just have different approaches to the topic. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to start playing this. Um, I kind of have it broken up into like the different segments, but if at any point, Jonathan, you want to stop and add anything, just let me know and I'll pause the clip. Um, mm -hmm. But let's dive into this. I bumped it up to one and a half times speed for just like time's sake. Uh, but let's dive right into this debate. Thank you, Dr. McClatchy. And I'll now turn it over to Alex O'Connor. You can introduce yourself and your opening statement. Uh, I can introduce myself as long as it doesn't come out of my time. My name is Alex. Uh, I am a graduate of philosophy and theology, and I'm a YouTuber. And that's about all there is to me, I'm afraid. Uh, but I'm ready when you are. Uh, if you could let me know when I've got two minutes remaining, two minutes, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, of course, Brian and Jonathan and Sattler College, and ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Uh, this is the second time that I've engaged with uh, Jonathan publicly. Uh, I'm glad to pick up where we left off. We didn't quite get to the bottom of God's existence last time. I'm confident we might get there today. Uh, I wonder, it'd be quite interesting just to get a fill of the room, actually. How many people here are Christians? Is that, is that the time? <laughs> I, I, okay, well, it looks like I've got my work cut out for me, but that's my favourite kind of debate, I think. Um, of course, this is an opening statement, so I won't respond to the arguments you just heard just yet. Instead, I want to uh, make my own case that upon uh, an honest analysis of the world we find ourselves in, it should compel us to dismiss the hypothesis of a supernatural creator. I will not be asking you to look in a... Okay, so do you have any, like, preliminary thoughts, like... I was thinking, like, this isn't necessarily related to, like, um, the, like anything Alex says, but I was like, oh, I don't know what Jonathan thinks, just, like, re-watching this and, like, just seeing himself kind of, like, over there on the side. Like, uh, uh, yeah, any, like, preliminary thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, Alex hasn't presented any of his arguments yet, uh, so I, I'm not sure if I have any particular remarks on that. Did, did you have any thoughts on it, Zach? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, he's a great presenter, but there's nothing like substance. Oh yeah, he's wise. he's very polished. Alex is very polished. He's uh, I would consider him a better public speaker than I am. He's he's very very good, um, very rhetorically skilled, and um, yeah, that that's what makes him a great debater, a great public speaker, and a um, great orator. Mm -hmm. All right, well let's get into it, and he's gonna start getting into like divine hiddenness in ancient scripture, nor to the beginning of the universe nor indeed down the microscope, instead just to your uh, direct experience of the world and facts about the lives of people within it. I will, however, indulge in a brief biblical recital um, because I want to begin with a book, uh, with a reading from the book of Psalms. So if you could all turn to Psalm 139, unless, of course, you've already committed this famous passage to memory. Verse 7 onwards reads, Where can I go from your presence? Or where can I flee from your spirit? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of the Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea. Even there your hand shall guide me and your right hand shall hold me fast. This poem in its entirety is given by the NRSV, a title, The Inescapable God. It's a message of bold reassurance to the believer, reminding them that since God is present everywhere, pervading every inch of our universe, he is, in the happiest sense possible, inescapable. But my first argument, and it's going to be the first of three, uh, against the Bible of theism, flows from the demonstrable fact that this divine consolation is seemingly not offered universally, and often in fact restricted from those who want it the most. I'm going to be making the claim specifically that atheism or naturalism provides a better account for three facts of our universe. The first being the hiddenness of God. The second being the geographical uh, statistical uh, uh, arrangement, shall we say, of religious belief. And the third will be the problem of gratuitous suffering. And we'll see if we get time to finish it off. Far from being unable to escape God, there is a very real contingent of non-believers, and I would count myself among their number, who are unable by any means to discover him, who seek and do not find, who knock and receive, as it were, no answer. This strange phenomenon is known as the problem of divine hiddenness. If there is a God, then simply, why is he hidden from so many of us so much of the time? If theism is to offer a sufficient account of reality, then it must offer an account of what J.L. Schellenberg has famously labelled non-resistant non-belief, which he distinguishes from resistant non-belief. It's sometimes said by a theist who wishes to explain uh, the problem of divine hiddenness that people simply disbelieve through their own fault. They're too stubborn. They're purposefully blinding themselves to the evidence because they don't want it to be true. They're not approaching the arguments on, uh, honestly with an open heart, and that if they would only do this, then God would surely reveal himself. Such a person would be what Schellenberg calls a resistant non-believer. He disbelieves in some sense because he actively resists it. For what it's worth, I do think that such people exist. I think many such people exist. Uh, there are people who come to this debate with their minds already made up. There are people who want it not to be true that God exists, and in fact wouldn't submit to that truth even if it were true. There was a recent poll run by the Atheist Experience YouTube channel, which I know, Jonathan, you're a fan of, uh, which asked, if there was a God, would you worship it? To which an astonishing 85% of respondents said that they would not. There are, however, also people who disbelieve in God, not out of resistance or stubbornness or a hardened heart, but rather due to sheer lack of conviction. Indeed, many such people actively want to be convinced of God's existence and would jump at the chance of entering into a relationship with him if they thought that he did. But no matter how hard they search, they simply find no answer for coming from the heavens. And this is the non-resistant non-believer. Formerly, then, here. Schellenberg's problem of divine hiddenness can be stated as... All right, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a famous problem of non-resistant non-belief, which, uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, was 
um, framed as such by uh, John Schellenberg. He coined that expression, that phrase, non-resistant non-believers. And I, I don't contest that there are such individuals who would qualify as non-resistant non-believers. I have no reason to doubt that Alex falls within that, that category. However, the, the point that I would contest is the, is, is the existence of long-term non-resistant non-believers. So someone can be a non-resistant non-believer at time T, and it merely be the case that God's not finished with them yet. That, what, that is to say that one will either become a resistant non-believer or one will become a Christian because I'm convinced that if one uh, diligently seeks after God and pursues him and the knowledge of him and relationship with him, that God will reveal himself through whatever means needed uh, to bring them to uh, a knowledge and awareness of himself. Um, and so, yeah, so I, 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 I don't contest that there are non-resistant non-believers. I'm more skeptical of whether there are long-term non-resistant non-believers. I'm persuaded that the evidence for Christianity is such that the one who does one's due diligence to make oneself fully informed about the evidence bearing on Christianity will, if, if one is doing one's, um, uh, one's best to be objective and impartial with the data, will in the long run come to find Christianity to be true and well supported. So that, that's kind of my perspective on the problem of, of non-resistant non-believers. Uh, Zach, do you have anything to, to add there? Or I've always wondered, um, that's really helpful, Jonathan, uh, like drawing the short-term versus like long-term distinction. I've always wondered, like, I always have thought about like our desires. Um, and like, sometimes I, I tend to, th I tend to think that like, there are no non-resistant non-believers and not from like a, like a pounding Romans one, like down your throat kind of thing, but more like, I think about like resistance, like if you have like maybe like contrary desires. So mm -hmm. I would think that like, say that like you have some desire that's contrary to like God, say you like you desire, um, you could choose anything that like stealing for, for stealing to be right. Um, but God, like in that sense, if you, if you like believe in the Christian God desires that like stealing is wrong. It's so, like, even like in that, some, in that sense, like, wouldn't like that person be resistant set to some level because they have a desire that's like contrary to God's. Um, if that's the case, then I think you could draw that out to like anyone to show that like no one's desires are perfectly in line with, with God's. I would no, think. That's, that's a very insightful point. I think you're completely correct that we our, our desires are often complex and we can have conflicting desires. And, so one could uh, desire relationship with God, but have a stronger desire for something that is contrary to mm -hmm. God's uh, design and his, his precepts and scripture and so forth. Um, and it, it, we, um, it, we scare, we, we're scarcely able to fully uh, examine and evaluate our own motivations because our, our own motivations are very complex and not all we're not always conscious of them completely um, and how much more do we lack uh, awareness of uh, people that other people's um, motivations and and um, the complexities of that so um, I, I think that it's it's quite difficult uh, without that information to make the positive argument from uh, non-resistant non-belief uh, for atheism. And then you've also got the point that I mentioned previously about um, someone can be a non-resistant non-believer at time T, and it's simply be the case that God's not done with them yet, that they will either mm -hmm. become a resistant non-believer or they will come to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. Like it's good for someone possibly to be a non-resistant non-believer at some time, uh, but that doesn't mean like they're going to finish their life a non-resistant non-believer. They're either going to become a Christian, like in your view, Jonathan, or they will become resistant at some point. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. Anything else here? Do you want to keep going? We can keep going. All right. Follows. Premise one. If there is a God, he is perfectly loving. Something I'm pretty sure Jonathan agrees with. Premise two. If a perfectly loving God exists, non-resistant non-belief does not occur. Premise three. Non-resistant non-belief does occur. Four. Therefore, no perfectly loving God exists. And the conclusion from the first premise is that therefore there is no God. A loving God, like the Christian God, would surely not refuse any willing person from developing a relationship with him. And so if somebody is truly non-resistant and open to receiving God's grace, we should expect them to receive it. Thus, Schellenberg's assertion that if God exists, then non-resistant non-belief does not exist. The question then, is there such a thing as non-resistant non-belief, a non-resistant non-believer, to which all I can really say is nice to meet you. The last time I debated Jonathan a number of years ago, when I was just a few months out of being a teenager, 
I said that even if I thought, even if I found Christianity to be true, I still wouldn't want to worship the God uh, that it promotes. I now, since then, have realized how irrational and self-defeating this assertion is, and stand before you today as an example of a non-resistant non-believer. I think it would be great if God existed. I really do. I would, I would absolutely love to escape death. I would relish being a recipient of unconditional love. Less selfishly, I would love to be able to worship that which deserves to be worshipped. I just don't think it's true. I try as I might, look where I can, I find no response, no hint, nothing. I don't choose to disbelieve in God any more than I choose to disbelieve in aliens, despite how much I might want them to. So, so maybe pause here. Psalm one three nine. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, just a couple of comments on that. Um, I, I do think that since uh, our first encounter um, back in, I think it was 2019, uh, I think Alex has made progress towards uh, um, at least uh, granting theism and even Christianity more more traction or greater credence than he did then. And so he has certainly made progress, I think, uh, towards uh, belief in Christianity. I, of course, he's not a Christian. I don't want uh, anyone to feel I'm misrepresenting him. But he, but I, 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 from both public and private conversations with Alex, I think that he has made progress. And so um, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not at all clear that it, he will remain in a state of long-term non-resistant non-belief. Uh, so that would be one point I would uh, say there. And what do you, any, anything to add to that, Zach? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, you could see, like, I try to remember the debate from, like, when you had with Alex way back when at the beginning. Um, and I'm like, there's this is definitely a different Alex. Um, the one point that I thought you brought up that was very insightful, Jonathan, um, is, like, thinking about, like, like Alex is like, he's making this claim about like his desires and whatnot. And like, I'm, I, I can't so psychoanalyze Alex, but like one thing I do think is helpful here and like, this can go both ways. Is, like there's a lot of desires like that we have under beneath, like beneath the surface. Like I can right. claim to be personally like, I'm like, Oh, I just perfectly rationally just came to the conclusion that Christianity is true. Um, and it's like, there's a lot of other, like maybe like contrary desires or competing desires that might be like under the surface. Right. And I think we have to recognize those as well. So, yeah. I, I think when Alex, first started his youtube channel uh, i i think that the alex that we know today is essentially unrecognizable from the alex that we see in his earliest videos i think i don't think that he would recognize himself if he were to look into the future um and see the alex that we we know today i don't think that he would recognize himself because he has come to uh, he's far less dismissive of theism and christianity in particular uh, he, I think, sees the, many of the arguments as being at least credible, um, far more so than he did back then. He's even produced a video which is published on his YouTube channel debunking his old self in regards to uh, the cosmological argument, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, um, if, if Alex couldn't have predicted where he'd be now when he first started his YouTube channel, then he knows where Alex could be 10 years down the road. So I, I, as I said, I think it's very difficult to make this argument from long term, for, from non-resistant non-belief, uh, for for those two reasons that our our um, desires can be complex, our motivations can be complex, and then also uh, that you got uh, that one never knows whether one will continue in non-resistant non-belief because one can go from a state of non-resistant non-belief to a state of resistant non-belief or to a state of being a Christian. And I, I, as I said before, I'm persuaded that God will um, reveal himself to those who diligently seek him through whatever means necessary. And uh, he will get, uh, he, he will bring people's attention to the evidence that indicates the truth of Christianity. Um, so that, and that's a conclusion I've come to on the basis of uh the background belief that God is good, God is perfectly good, and that is justified by the arguments bearing positively on Christianity. So given that there is such, in my judgment, good evidence for Christianity, that leads me to the belief that God is good, and therefore that he will, in fact, reveal himself to those who diligently seek him, because that is most consistent with his morally good character. Mm. That's really good, Jonathan, and I like how uh, you like to say like, hey, if we're going to say that like God is perfectly good, um, as like Alex O'Connor's arguing against in this debate, we have to consider like what are the consequences of there being like a perfectly good God? And like if that God exists, then it would follow like in the long run that there would be like no non-resistant non-believers. Um, yeah, I think that's great, Jonathan. It makes great sense to me. All right, I will keep on playing. Overwhelmed with a sense not of beauty and consolation, but envy and disappointment. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go, I should ask in response, to find it? Of course, you cannot know my heart. You can't know if I'm truly as non-resistant as I claim, but I hope that my actions here might betray me. Uh, as, as a Catholic child, I was once an, an altar boy. I would serve the altar of Mother Church every Sunday, dressed in a white robe. Um, in the time since then, I have, to put it mildly, been looking for God. I went to Catholic schools. I studied philosophy and theology at A-levels. I made a career out of engaging with religious arguments. I've explored arguments from contingency, from fine-tuning, from motion, from mathematics, from, indeed, from uh, irreducible complexity and the alleged resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. It may surprise my followers online to learn uh, that at university I visited numerous churches on the invitation of various friends. I spent hours talking with religious friends until the sun rose again, if you like. I spent, I attended Bible groups regularly, too, which might surprise people. Uh, as well. And in fact, I, I still do attend such groups. Just recently, I agreed to embark on a series of study of the wisdom literature, specifically reading it again in the hopes that this time I might finally feel a divine presence seeping from between the lines. I moved into a house for a year with two devoutly Christian housemates with the express intention of seeing if the obvious truth of Christianity and theism that people like to talk about can be found in the minutiae of daily life. I have looked, in other words, in a great deal of places. I read Athanasius and Anselm. I read Augustine and Aquinas. I, I looked in Julian of Norwich and Catherine of Siena. I looked at the sociological origin of religious belief in Durkheim and Marx and Freud and Young. I looked at religious experience in William James and Rudolf Otto. I've looked in the modern works of people like Ed Faser and Bill Craig and Michael Murray and Richard Swinburne and Alvin Plantinga. I've looked in poetry. I've looked in the Psalms. I've looked in Job. I've looked in Ecclesiastes. I've looked in Dostoevsky. I read C.S. Lewis. I listened to worship music. I prayed. I studied the gospel. I even got an actual degree in theology from a university and nothing. Nothing, not once, not nearly, not ever, not even briefly have I experienced anything that speaks to the existence of a God in the universe. Can we stop here? I think it's asking yeah. a lot. I, I do wonder whether Alex would say that his extensive reading in those fields has, has not increased his credence in theism or in Christianity more particularly. I, th I think that he would have to admit um, from my own conversations with Alex, uh, including uh, this debate uh, and... Um, and uh, other conversations I've had with Alex, I, I, I think that he would have to admit that his credence in theism and indeed Christianity has increased through his reading. Um, and so I, I don't think that it's quite accurate to say nothing. There is nothing there that has um, led him closer to believe in God. Um, I, I would also contend that the evidence for the existence of God is, is, squ is quite spectacular, spanning multiple academic disciplines, both the physical and life sciences. Uh, it's really quite impressive. And yeah, one can read all the read about all the evidence and still find oneself uh, dissatisfied and unconvinced. But I would argue that in that case, if, if one has taken the trouble to make oneself fully informed, that one is not being rational in uh, affirming the truth of theism. I think that the evidence, I, I think that the existence of God is something which is an obvious truth about the world. Um, far more obvious than Christianity. I don't think Christianity is immediately obvious in the same way that theism is. But uh, yeah, if pe people if people call themselves um, non-resistant non-believers in regards to Christianity, um, it makes me wonder why they don't accept theism, because theism seems to me to be so immediately obvious from looking at the created world, in particular the the complexity and designoid features of biology, which is... Um, on exhibit all around us uh, throughout the natural world. Mm. I think that's interesting, Jonathan, how like Alex is coming, like his point is like, he's looking at like a lot of it's like, like his own like experience. Like, he's looking for like that, like that, like spiritual tingling or something like that, like that kind of like feeling Um, what you're saying is like, well, you have to understand like, there's like, like, sure that could be valuable, but there's also like a lot more points. Like Alex talked about how he's read all these great, like natural theologians and like, look at the, like the data from like science and all these different things. And you're saying like, Hey, like this, this is really, really good evidence. Like, and it's like things that like even Alex would admit have like pushed him towards like the theism direction. And like, because of that, like, the, like there's more than enough to like jump on board with theism. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. I, I think that the evidence for theism is spectacular and it it's un unlike Christianity, the evidence for theism is immediately accessible just by observing the world around us. You don't have to go and study the Bible and ancient texts and so forth, but the evidence for, for theism is immediately accessible and it's, it spans multiple disciplines all converging in the same direction. So irrespective of what one makes of Christianity, it seems to me that uh, one, uh, ought to accept theism uh, because of just how overwhelming the the evidence is, particularly if one has studied uh, the uh, all the literature that Alex talks about and uh, the arguments from natural theology and so forth. And so if one is claiming to be a non-resistant non-believer, 
on the one hand, while rejecting such a, a, what seems to me to be an obvious truth on the other, that, to be honest, makes me uh, somewhat more skeptical about the extent to which one is completely non-resistant. Um, does, does that make sense, Zach? Can you repeat that a little bit? I think I'm tracking with you, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, um, I, I think that the evidence for theism is quite overwhelming uh, mm -hmm. and is immediately accessible. It's immediately obvious. Um, and so if one uh, claims to be a non-resistant non-believer, uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, and it seems to me to be incontestable that there are non-resistant non-believers. There are people that have never heard of Christianity, for example. Um, but uh, nonetheless, everyone has access to natural revelation, which... Mm -hmm. uh, um, it seems to me, is is quite overwhelming in confirming theism. And so if one uh, claims to be a non-resistant non-believer on the one hand, but then rejects su such spectacularly overwhelming evidence on the other for, for theism, then that leads me to be skeptical that one is completely non-resistant non uh, non-believer um, because one is being uh, irrational in their rejection of theism. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, that's helpful, Jonathan, because you, you're saying, like, when we're looking at, like, the evidence for God, like, it's very easily, like, accessible. Like, you can just, like, look right. around you and kind of see, like, the evidence for God. So, so if, if, if God were to make the evidence for Christianity as blindingly obvious as the evidence for theism, then what, uh, then, uh, I mean, how, how could God make it even more, how could God make it more obvious than he's made the, the existence of of himself through the the works of, of creation through nature through natural theology uh, and so if, if god were to make the evidence for christianity as immediately accessible and immediately obvious as the evidence for the existence of god then what leads you what what should lead one to think that you would accept christianity given that you reject theism which is immediately accessible and immediately obvious in that sense mm. Okay, that's helpful, Jonathan. So, like, how would you respond to, like, maybe, like, Alex who would say, well, well, Jonathan, I've looked at this evidence, and I just don't find it, like, super convincing. Like, maybe it pushes me towards theism, but I don't find, like, the same power in it as you do. Yeah, well, I, I'd be interested in finding out why he doesn't find the same power mm -hmm. in it. Uh, and I think that uh, when one looks at atheist critiques of those arguments, they're just not very good. Um, yeah. So, yeah, one might not find them powerful, but I would argue that one is, in that case, being irrational. Um, okay. I, I, I'm convinced that uh, one cannot be both fully informed and fully rational at the same time uh, in, in rejecting uh, Christianity uh, or theism, uh, in particular in particular theism, because the evidence for theism is even stronger in my judgment than the case for Christianity. Um, so, yeah, we can move on. Mm, okay, that's super helpful, Jonathan. So let's keep on rolling lot of any atheist to seriously engage with a religion that he does not believe is true in any circumstances. But I feel like I have gone above and beyond what can be reasonably expected of any atheist who wishes to entertain the God hypothesis, and for my efforts I have been awarded radio silence. The inescapable God of the NRSV, in other words, is for me the invisible God, or the inapproachable God, the deaf distant God. The best account that I can give of this experience, of complete and utter silence from deaf heaven, is that all that truly exists to me is impersonal space and air and rocks. I know, I know it sucks, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a shame, there's no need to cry about it. And nothing more. My question to Jonathan then is simple. How can theism account for this lived experience? How can it account, in other words, for non-resistant non-belief? And if atheism, uh, doesn't atheism, offer a better explanation at the very least? Am I a non-resistant non-believer? If so, what offers a best account, or a better account, of such a condition? A universe in which there is a loving God who does want to be my friend, but is for some reason refusing, or hiding, or toying with me? Or a universe without one? Or is there no such thing as a non-resistant non-believer, which is the only remaining option? Do we all secretly resist in some way or other? After desperately, in other words, trying to convince myself of God's existence for years and being left painfully unconvinced, will you just submit, as if to add insult to this spiritual injury, that this is uh, in some way my fault? And if it is, then what could I have done differently? What should I be doing differently? What could I possibly have done differently, given the course of my life? Now, assume for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, the alternative hypothesis of naturalism, of atheism, and ask if it provides a good account of non-resistant non-belief. And I think the answer is obvious. But it does get worse yet. Yeah, so you'll remember that my second fact that I said that I would bring up. Okay, before we get into the second fact, Jonathan, is there anything else you want to say with regards to, like, Alex and his appeal to, like, to him? Like, God just seems, like, very hidden. Uh, no, I, I think I've um, made most of the points I would make in regards to the problem of divine hiddenness. Uh, I, I, to summarize, I, I don't think that it's... I, I don't. I think it's difficult to make the positive case for non-belief on the basis of divine hiddenness on the grounds that... Uh, one can 
one can grant the existence of non-resident non-believers and argue that God is not finished with such individuals, that they will either become eventually a resistant non-believer or in the fullness of time will become a Christian. And uh, furthermore, uh, there is co complexity of desires and um, we don't, it, it, we are not always the best at introspection. And so, so it's, it, given the goodness of God, that gives me uh, grounds on which to think that God will reveal himself to those who diligently seek him. Uh, and yeah, so that, that's essentially what I would say on the problem of, of a non-resistant non-belief. Anything to add to that? I don't think so. I think we've covered a lot of ground. So like looking at like his argument, um, like where Alex is going to say, like the, if there's a perfect God, like there's no non-resistant non-believers, you've kind of mm -hmm. said like, hey, like given like theism, like there's good reason to think that like over time, like there would be none, but maybe God would allow there to be some for like at the time. Um, so I think that's helpful. And we kind of looked at like, complex desires um and like the really strong power of natural theology which can kind of do work against the idea of there being um potentially there being like non-resistant non-believers um but you don't have to deny that they exist like for for you to have a, like an a good objection to this argument right exactly all right well if you're ready to go we can look at religious diversity only spends a few minutes here on this um point is the geographical predictability of religious belief. Not only does theism need to account for non-resistant non-belief, but also for the fact that such belief is unequally present across the globe. Stephen Mason has pointed out that the populace of Saudi Arabia is 95% Muslim and therefore 95% theistic, whereas the populace of Thailand is 95% Buddhist and therefore at best 5% theistic. How likely you are to be a theist, in other words, is intimately tied to the place in which you happen to be born. What can better explain this geographical spread? Theism or naturalism or atheism? Let's consider our two competing hypotheses. Could it be that God does exist, but that the Thai are simply naturally 20 times more likely to be resistant to believe in God than, say, the Saudis? Are they just naturally 20 times more stubborn or something? This seems implausible. This doesn't seem to be their fault. Okay, so maybe then it's not their fault, and God just has some reason to hide his face disproportionately more from the Thai than from Saudis, or indeed from those born here in Massachusetts, which uh, has a theistic, according to one statistic, is 75% theistic. If theism is true, it seems to me that God has a lot to answer for here. Is it not troubling, Jonathan, for as a Christian, that your place, your place of birth is a reliable statistical indicator of how likely you are to be saved? I'll say that again. Your place of birth, which is entirely arbitrary, is a reliable indicator of how likely you are on Christianity to be saved. You're significantly more likely to be a theist if you're born in Rwanda than if you're born in Thailand. Can this situation really obtain under the supervision of a God who wants to come to know us and makes his existence equally accessible to all? The chances seem infinitely small. Now consider naturalism or atheism. Religion varying by region is exactly what we would expect if it is a man-made cultural phenomenon and nothing like what we should expect if there is, in fact, one true God who loves all equally. Again, I think atheism provides a much stronger account of this fact of our world. Finally, then. Okay, okay. so where do you want to take this, Jonathan? Yeah, a um, couple of points there. Uh, first of all, it's, it's interesting to me that in uh, that the Christ Christianity is actually on the decline in the West, right? America, the UK, that have been traditionally considered Christian countries, whereas Christianity is actually on the rise globally, particularly in Asia and Africa. And uh, Christianity, uh, unlike uh, Islam, uh, is very transcendent of, of cultures and is uh, something which uh, is um, it, it's, it's culturally transcendent and it's on, the, it's on the rise in, as I said, Africa and Asia. Furthermore, I think God reveals himself uh, especially to those individuals who uh, don't, uh, who have less access to the public evidence for Christianity. Uh, so for example, um, in the Muslim world, there are people that be, get converted through dreams and visions and so forth by special revelation of God to them privately. And uh, I, I suspect that the same might be true of those uh, individuals who just never get to hear the gospel, such as the Amazonian tribesmen, they just don't have access to evangelists. So God has some morally just arrangement for such individuals, even if we're not privy to those arrangements, perhaps he reveals himself in some special way to them. Um, or perhaps he um he uh, he just holds them accountable for that information that they do have access to from natural theology and so forth um i, I actually know someone in my own circle of contacts who uh came to christ uh relatively recently uh through uh experiencing a dream of jesus uh, they come from a muslim background and i actually know this individual on both sides of their conversion so i can definitely attest to this uh, incident. And it seems to me that this is uh, quite prevalent in the Muslim world. And so, yeah, I, I, I think that 
I am confident that God will reveal himself to those individuals who would, uh, if, if given sufficient evidence, come to form relationship with him. And uh, there, there's some evidence for that being the case. Anything to, to add there, Zach? Yeah. So I wonder then, Jonathan, like you talked about like God being willing to like form relationship with those um, who are willing. So how would you like maybe like use that to like respond to like, what about like 2000 years ago? What about like the Amazonian tribesmen like today mm. um, that has no like contact with like, anything like Jesus in terms of like a Western view? Um, you could say people 2000 years ago that like lived in like Southeast Asia or like the plains of Africa or like Native Americans. Like, like, wh- how do you think about them? For the Amazonian tribesmen or the, the person that's just never heard the gospel, uh, we, we just simply don't know, nor do we need to know uh, what God's arrangement is. I mean, and there, there's probably a good reason why God hasn't disclosed to us what his arrangements are for such individuals. Because if he told us that everyone who doesn't hear the gospel will just get an immediate pass to heaven, well, that what would that do to our motivation for evangelism, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we, so we, we just don't know. Um it's possible that God gives them an opportunity after death, uh, or it's, it's possible that uh, he reveals himself in some special way, perhaps through dreams and visions or miraculous events or what have you, or perhaps uh, he appropriates the value of Christ's death to them, or um, uh, even in the absence of explicit belief in Christ, or perhaps... Uh, um, uh, yeah, the, um, perhaps yeah, there's 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 various there's various solutions here, and we don't necessarily need to know which is the correct one. Um, but since we have grounds for thinking that God is morally just, that provides us with in, an indirect basis on which to say that there is probably some uh, morally just arrangement that God has for such individuals, even if we're not privy to what that arrangement is. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's, I think that's super helpful. Like you're kind of like saying like, hey, like like giving God, like we we don't really fully know how everything is going to play out when we think about like the long term um and whatnot so i think that's super helpful jonathan um the other thing that i thought that was interesting that alex brought up is he said that like evidence of birth just indicates like whether someone's saved or not um but like as you said like with a lot of these people like we don't really know like for the person that's never heard the gospel like is it we don't really know. Like you can't really say like what their probability is of them being saved or anything like that. Cause there's just a lot of like mystery here. Um, so yeah, I just found that interesting. Cause I think you and I, and like most Christians would just like disagree with Alex when he says that like evidence of birth, like indicates whether or not someone would be saved. Yeah. I mean, there, there is a statistical correlation between place of birth and um, religion. Uh, that's, that's certainly true. But it's, as I said, it's, it's interesting that, uh, Christianity is on the rise globally, and it's not. Um, uh, it's not. Um, it, it, it's it's not where you ex- would expect in the Western countries like America and Britain. It's on the decline here, but it's on the rise in in Africa and Asia. And uh, we have evidence of God revealing Himself in dreams and visions to people in the Muslim world. And as I said, I, I think God. God, no, I mean this is divine. The idea of divine, the concept of divine middle knowledge, right? God knows how people would. Uh, receive certain types of evidence and if God knows someone's heart and knows that they would um, choose him if given a certain amount of evidence then I have confidence that God will give them that evidence uh, to uh, bring them to a knowledge of himself and Mm -hmm. bear in mind also that God is not merely interested in belief in him he's not merely interested in people intellectually assenting and being convinced that he exists but he's interested in relationship with people and so god knows what people would choose to do if they actually came to be convinced of his existence whether they would actually choose relationship with him uh, as opposed to merely assenting to believe in god okay yeah that's super helpful jonathan um Anything else you want to say with regards to religious diversity before we kind of dive into like Alex and the problem of evil? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, suffices. All right. Well, let's look at his views then on the problem of evil. The third fact of our universe, which is gratuitous suffering. Gratuitous here means something like unjustified or unwarranted or meaningless. I do this because it's easy to see how some instances of suffering may be uh, beneficial in certain circumstances or necessary to bring about some desirable state of affairs, some desirable end. But the existence of meaningless or unnecessary suffering does seem to be incompatible with the existence of a God who loves us and has the power to prevent it from happening. We're sometimes told that 
God has morally sufficient reason to allow suffering to exist. Indeed, if God is good, then he must have such sufficient reason. Perhaps suffering is necessitated by human free will. Perhaps suffering helps to develop a person's moral character, or maybe it's necessary to achieve some other end that God wishes to bring about. But intuitively, there appear to be instances of suffering that cannot serve any such end. And if even one example of these turns out to be an actual case of unnecessary or meaningless suffering, this would be enough to cause a problem. I want to propose something that might sound a little strange at first, which is that the biggest problem for theism here is not famously the, the great intense sufferings of the world, like holocausts or earthquakes, but rather menial, uh, menial, less significant suffering, like being caught out in the rain or serving your toe or tripping over a curb on the street. Why? It seems a tad absurd, I'll, I'll grant you that, but consider this, when we experience a great suffering, like the death of a loved one or a devastating earthquake or indeed a holocaust, it's easy to imagine that this might somehow be part of a grand plan, the depth of our suffering uh, may make us into better people. The people who die may be experiencing a much happier state of affairs in the afterlife now. Perhaps by allowing the Jewish Holocaust to take place, God uh, makes it such that we are far less likely to allow even worse uh, projects of genocide to occur in the future. But what could possibly be served? What possible end could be served? What possible meaning could there be in serving your toe or tripping over the curb or having a pigeon use your new suit as a restroom? Such instances are not significant. They're usually forgotten within a day or two and therefore Stop. do not Maybe. and cannot develop mm -hmm. the soul. Yeah, so the, the problem with menial sufferings, I actually think is the weakest of Alex's points in this debate. Um, I, I don't see any reason why menial sufferings can also be part of soul building, character building. Um, this this life is, I, I would argue, a moral probation. That is an idea that was put forward by Joseph Butler in his book, Analogy of Religion. And um, we are... We, we undergo various trials in this life to test us and to shape and mold our character. Uh, and we engage, we engage in um, moral decision-making and so forth. And uh, I, I think that even menial sufferings like stubbing our toe or having uh, a pigeon user and use it as a restroom or what have you, I think that these can, I think that um, that can be part of our moral probation, that it, it, um, it tests how we respond to such uh, such sufferings, menial though they be. Uh, so I, I don't really find that to be a particularly potent expression of the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wonder, like, couldn't you say a lot of these, like, maybe like, like these, like little bits of suffering here, like stubbing your toe and whatnot. Couldn't you say it's something like that's just a consistent environment? Like it would seem like it would seem weird. Yeah, think, like we'd have a world where like, um, like there would be like these great evils about like, which Alex seems like, well, maybe you could like draw some good about them from like death or cancer um, or natural disasters and like a world where like there's good from theirs, but then like all these like, like really small degrees of suffering, like just like don't happen. Uh, like you're like walking and you're about to like hit, stub your toe and all of a sudden, like you just don't feel anything. You just keep on walking. Like it just seems like a very like irregular almost kind yeah, of world. Or God, if we have God were to intervene every time we were about to step our toe and <laughs> pull our foot away from the door or what have you. Um, yeah, you're, you're completely right. And I, I mentioned this in the debate, in fact, uh, that yeah, um, menial sufferings is a necessary consequence of a consistent environment, as you said, a, a, an environment that obeys uh, natural regularities and laws and so forth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Anything else, Jonathan, on this little bit right here? No, I think we can move on. So, nor do they seem plausibly part of some grand design or plan. They seem, that is to say, meaningless and unnecessary. More meaningless, uh, more meaninglessness than instances of, let's say, great uh, or intense suffering, much more meaningless than these. And truly meaningless, unnecessary suffering is certainly more expected in a world without benevolent supervision than in a theistic paradigm. A successful theodicy, in other words, then, needs to provide not only an account of the great and intense sufferings of the world, but also the menial sufferings which pervade the human experience. Now, I'm actually quite surprised uh, that I've made it this far without mentioning animals yet. It's quite unlike me, but that's a final consideration that does deserve our attention. Whatever theodicy might explain human suffering, the existence of animal suffering seems infinitely more difficult to explain. Animals are not free in the way that we are, and so are immune to the free will defense. They cannot morally develop in the way that we can. And so are immune to soul-making theodicies. They are, on most accounts, not going to heaven, and so they will not be compensated for their suffering. Yet their suffering is immeasurably large. Somewhere, right now, billions of animals are suffering in the wild, from predation, from disease, from hunger, from fear. Imagine a deer with its leg caught under a fallen tree, dying of starved confusion. It doesn't know why it's there. It feels hungry, it's starving to death, and it's trapped under a tree, and it has no idea why. What could possibly be the purpose or meaning of this? I'll remind you that this is exactly, exactly the kind of thing that we should expect to see if the natural world is an amoral arena of accidentally existing organisms fighting with each other to stay alive. But can we really expect this on theism? Should we expect this on theism? What offers a better account? 
Um, keep in mind that, in other words, I'm not arguing that theism can offer no account of these kinds of situations and sufferings, though I am skeptical that it can. I'm only arguing that assuming that theism is false offers a better account of it than assuming that theism is true. Assume atheism, assume that human beings and other animals are nothing more than evolved creatures who developed pain receptors to make them more prone to avoiding the menial and great sufferings that upset our survival prospects. On this account, the existence of all suffering, small and great, is not only explained, but expected. Thus, atheism offers a better account, in my view, than theism of three crucial and unavoidable facts, divine hiddenness, geographical religious statistics, and the existence of gratuitous human and non-human suffering. And I am truly excited to hear how Jonathan might account for these uh, on theism in defending it as a more plausible account of our reality. Thank you. Okay, so what do you think? You brought up the problem of animal suffering here, John. Yeah, I think the problem of animal suffering is Alex's strongest point. Um, uh, I don't think that there is a good uh, theistic response, and he's, he's completely correct that uh, though uh, one can argue that there's a Atheism is compatible with animal suffering. Atheism does offer a better account thereof, just as I would argue theism offers a better account of the facts that I considered in my opening statement, uh, the evidence of biological design, the case for the resurrection, and indeed, although I didn't cover it in my opening statement in this particular debate, the arguments from the physical sciences for design as well. Um, I think that theism offers a much better account of those considerations. So it's a matter of which of the sets of considerations are stronger and more substantive, uh, more numerous than uh, than the other. And uh, I, I, I think w when it comes to animal suffering, we don't really know uh, we don't, what, how, how animals experience suffering um, as at a first person subjective level because we are not non-human animals and um god clear god gave instructions to kill animals for food he's given humans dominion over the animals and uh, animals are also prescribed for use and sacrifice as well and so I, I think this is just something that we have to trust to god's goodness that uh w whatever the experience of the animal is like um it's it th there it is um um, not the the same as how a, uh, how a human experiences suffering, and uh, um, so that, that's that's kind of what I would say on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that's an interesting point, Jonathan. Um, because I like how you're not going full on like animals just don't experience pain because they don't have a soul or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But you are like trying to point out and say like, hey, there is some mystery on like how much animals actually like do experience and like what is their suffering like? Um, because we just don't know. I mean, you know, that, like if there right. is a good God, he would he wouldn't like cause meaningless suffering upon them. Right, exactly. And and not, and of course, it it's, goes without saying that uh, not all animal suffering is equal, right? I don't think an insect suffers the same way as a chimpanzee, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I, I don't think a bird suffers in the same way as um, as a more complex organism like a gorilla or or um, yeah a, 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 some some other complex mammal. Um, I, and as I said before, we we just we don't have that insider knowledge of what it is to be an animal, and so. Yeah, there is an argument from analogy because we experience pain in a certain way, and so animals uh, likely do as well. But if you also have independent grounds to think that theism is true, and in particularly Christian theism, then that provides some justification for thinking that animal suffering that um, is uh, compatible and consistent with uh, a good and loving God. And so that provides an indirect basis for thinking that whatever the animal suffering is like, it is such that it makes it morally just for God to prescribe killing animals for food and sacrifice and so forth. Mm, yeah, that's super helpful, Jonathan. So another thing that's interesting, like thinking about animal suffering um, is like, what are your thoughts on like an animal, like afterlife? Um, Cause I know some, like a lot of like Christians and theists, like more recently have like pushed ideas that like, well, maybe all animals are resurrected um, and maybe not, it's not like compensation, but like maybe the animals can come to like, um, and sometimes have those evils like defeated um, or like made right or something along those lines or like their sufferings are like similar how we would point to like our sufferings turning into like maybe goods. Um, the animal maybe either consciously or unconsciously, like their sufferings here would turn into like goods. Yeah. Um, I'm less convinced of that approach. It's possible. It's not impossible. Uh, but it seems it seems rather contrived to me. Uh, 
I, I know that uh, Trent Doherty um, makes that argument uh, in his work. Um, yeah, it, it's possible. I, I just don't find it particularly convincing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're at the end of this um, opening statement for Alex, and I would encourage people to really like check out this debate, and I'll leave it linked down below where people can like listen to the whole thing. But like, do you have any like remarks about this debate, Jonathan? Like anything that you would want to talk about before you wrap up here that might be relevant? No, I encourage viewers to go and uh, listen to my own opening statement and uh, rebuttals to Alex, uh, particularly as I present the positive case for theism. Uh, uh, and I, I developed that argument from the evidence of biological design as well as the resurrection. Uh, obviously, I only have time to do a very uh, succinct summary of that evidence. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can find that fleshed out in a lot more detail in my published work. And um and uh, you can find a lot of that on my personal website, Um I don't really have a lot more to, to say on that other than go watch the full debate. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to um, plug your Talk About Doubts uh, website because I had it pulled up here as you were talking about it. And I think it is like super like useful for people. So I'm just pulling up my tab here. But, like look at as you pull up this website, um, talk about doubts.com, like just look at all the like heavy hitters you have. Like it just like it keeps going. Um, like Justin Bass, Tim McGrew, Luke Barnes, Braxton Hunter, Alan Hel Hel Heinlein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the French dude. I don't even know how to say his name. Yum, bing, yum. <laughs> <laughs> um Casey, like there's just so many, and like it keeps going. So I would encourage people, like, if you have like doubts or questions, like check out this resource. It's an amazing um resource by the grace of god jonathan that you've put together because there's just so much here um so as we close i would encourage people to check out talking about doubts talk about doubts.com because there's just so much value um in this resource so thank you so much for putting this together jonathan and thank you so much for coming on today i really enjoyed this conversation i thought it was super great absolutely thanks so much for having me on zach Alrighty, well, this is Ethereum Apologetics, everyone. If you're new, I encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. We really, really value your support, um, and that's that. If you value what we do, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Ethereum Apologetics. But Jonathan, thank you so much one last time for coming on. Really appreciate you and your time, and I hope to everyone listening that you found this edifying. Thank you. All right, have a good one, everyone, and God bless. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>